We will call on Malam Muhammad Nasser Ishaq, who is going to talk on the fifth sub theme presentation, The Principles of Patient-Centered Care, A Path to Wholesome Wellness. Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته by coincidence this is the the last presentation and also trying to recap all what has happened from yesterday to now the patient centered care a path to wholesome wellness. I would like to start by drawing our attention to one clear fact. Just imagine, if you are listening to me, just imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy will decide tomorrow that Every person that is living on the surface of the earth will be healthy. No any sick person, no patient. Imagine if that will happen. Then ask yourself, what happens to your job? What happens to your knowledge? And what happens to your investment in healthcare? Obviously, you will lose your job because everyone is healthy on the surface of the earth as a healthcare practitioner. Obviously, every investment you have done will go in vain because everyone is healthy. No one will need your service. Certainly, this will never happen. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot do that, but we will not do that. And for this reason, it means the patient as a patient it's a very important material. It's key to your occupation. And that is the more reason that we should value the patient because he is central to what we are doing. And this is what we are trying to say that care should be. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We wish to commend all of us for our active participation in these sessions thus far. But we also want to encourage us to honor this speaker by please paying rapt attention to his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And for this reason, we are advocating to give the patient the required attention and the required care from the perspective of the patient. Now this is what my discussion in the next 15 to 20 minutes will concentrate upon. When we say patient-centered care, we are not the first people to, to bring about the concept. The International Institute of Medicine as you might have all known, that has been existing in the last 50 years, from 1970 to date. It is non-governmental, independent authority that is guiding or giving authoritative information to decision makers. And it tried to define what a patient-centered care is. This is a standard definition anywhere you've gone. It says, it is the type of care that is respectful of and, and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guides all clinical decisions. Now, this is building on what the guest speaker has mentioned yesterday that most times when we are conceptualizing care, we conceptualize it from our own point of view, 
not from the patient's point of view. Now, patient-centered care is about treating a person, receiving health care with dignity and respect, and involving them in all decisions about their health. It can also be referred to as person-centered care. Now, I, 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 I try to bring a scenario to also give us opportunity to understand how important the patient is. And the scenario is talking about a watermelon seller. As, just imagine you are, you, are the, you are the person selling watermelon. You all know what, what watermelon is. And uh, this watermelon is imported from a distant place. And you have two drivers. One driver, by the time you place an order, will bring you only 5% of the watermelon intact because of the nature of the road. And the second driver will bring 95% of the watermelon. Only 5% will be damaged along the road. Who among these people will you give him the supply of your watermelon? Certainly the driver that will bring 95%. Now we that are seated here, and every healthcare worker that is elsewhere around the country or around the globe, we are the watermelon sellers. If you are giving a patient-centered care, or your care is patient-centered, you are regarded as a person, as a driver, that brings 95% of the watermelon intact. Only 5% are mistakes, errors, negligence, and some ignorance. And if you are not, you are that driver that brings only 5%. So 95% of the services you render are damages. Now this is the implication of when we do treatment, or when you give, we give care without giving the due respect, the due dignity, the due value to that patient. Because in the end, the patient may not be satisfied. In the end, the patient may not get the wholesome care. In the, in the end, the patient will not, will not be healthy. What are you doing? Maybe only 5% of your clients are getting well. 95% are just there waiting for you to go. Some of them can even voice out their concern about you. I need someone to assist me with the laptop. Yeah, it's okay. So now these are the benefits if we take the approach of patient-centered care in our health facilities in our individual way of doing things, and in also in our organizational system or organizational concept of giving care to the patients. The International Institute of Medicine endorsed six dimensions vis-a-vis -vis patient-centered care. Now, look at these dimensions. They are, one, respectful to patients, to patients' values, patients' preferences, and their express needs. Coordinated and integrated. Care must be coordinated and integrated. And also, care must provide information, communication, and education. Care must also ensure physical comfort. And care must provide emotional support, relieving fear and, and anxiety. And also, you are expected to involve family and friends in patients' care. Look at these dimensions. Compare them with what is happening in our respective health facilities. As a manager, as uh, maybe uh, a, a low cadre worker, or maybe as an institutional head, in what way are our hospitals 
reflecting the six dimensions of patient-centered care. Let's give some, uh, take one or two of the dimensions and analyze. Just imagine, when we say our care must be respectful, must be respectful to patients, preferences, their needs, and values. How many, how many, how many times, okay, let me put it this way. What percentage of all the people that are coming to our hospital today, and I do not set aside any hospital, what percentage of all the clients that are coming to our, our hospitals, in the end, get the required satisfaction? I've not come across any client satisfaction survey in any hospital around Nigeria. There could be. But generally, institutional heads, what I mean by institutional heads are the, the MDs, the chief medical directors that are heading our hospitals. How many of them and how many times a year do they care to, co to, to consult or to contract independent surveyors, maybe at the gate of the hospital? Find out for me maybe on quarterly basis, maybe every six months, and maybe at least once a year. Conduct a survey for me for every person that is coming into the hospital and give me the, the statistics, give me the graph. How are they satisfied? How expensive? How are the clinicians handling you? What are, what are the outcome, health outcome, and so on? And, and this information is critical to a manager. Not only when you are heading a hospital, but also if you are heading a department in a hospital, you have the wherewithal to conduct such a survey. For instance, if you are the head of the records, health information management system, can you take one hour in a year to make a survey on how clients coming to the hospital are being assisted to get to the clinicians? Or if you are heading a laboratory, take one hour in a year to make a survey. How are these people enjoying my service? So it doesn't have to be the head of the hospital. Most times, we are in our own way, like someone yesterday, the, pre national, uh, the president mentioned that uh, some of us are kings and queens in our respective domains. But at the same time, we are administrators, managers in our respective domains, and you can make your department better than the other departments. Certainly, patients are suffering. There is no doubt about this. Clients, patients, families, and friends are really suffering because of one thing or the other. So we need to work to reduce this thing. We cannot eradicate it overnight, but we have the way with that to reduce the sufferings patients are undergoing. Sometimes, when you discuss with clinicians about patient-centered care, they have their excuses. One of the excuses is the time constraint, that I have large volume of patients to attend to. How will I be listening to them? And if you do not listen, then you have not communicated. Now you have violated one of the cardinal dimensions of the patient-centered care. How do we solve this? The way we can solve this are multifaceted. And I think majority of the hospital have a way of reducing the workload, for especially for the doctors clerking patients. You have minimum number of patients that you will see in a day. But how much or how, how, how careful, how qualitative are we doing it? But I also think that technology can help. I visited a hospital, and it was an antenatal uh, day, and I saw clients, I couldn't count, but I'm pretty sure that there are more than 500 women seated down waiting for one row of clinicians for the antenatal. And, and, and one of the points I've attended was only for the, for, for the vital signs. And it takes a lot of time for you, maybe one midwife, two midwives, three midwives, taking the vital signs of 500 patients. This is not possible. They cannot do it well. But how about if we can automate most of these things? Because technology has brought us to the point that 
most of the uh, vital signs, they, yeah, they, you, can, you can just get them through biometrics. You can, you can employ technology, real technology into our hospitals. Most of our distance can be alleviated. Not putting one person, taking care of 100 plus clients at a point in time. So time constraint, agreed. Sometimes the clinici clinicians are not enough. Sometimes are not there. Sometimes they have conflicting demands. But definitely, we should not hide behind the excuse of time constraint to, 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 to refuse to make our care patient centers. The other one is sometimes there are conflicts between the patient preferences and the standards of science and technology. This is also very true, but I think it's not about the patient, but it's about the, his level of literacy, health literacy especially. And I think our public health sector, in whatever level, are responsible, purely responsible of ele elevating the health literacy of the population of this country. Some of the decisions, some of the preferences, some of the choices patients are making, they are making it because of their ignorance or because of their low level of health literacy. I will rest my case with also trying to bring back technology again. The clinical decision support system is a system that supports the doctor or the nurse or the pharmacist or whoever is working in the hospital to, to help him is enhancing your capability. Just like the artificial intelligence is doing, this is also artificial intelligence related software that can help you, can prompt you, can tell you most of the things artificial intelligence can do. Uh, yeah, yeah can, can, can reduce our workload. So I'm also advocating that we look at like uh, the research collaboration also, uh, so, uh, uh, some other speakers before I, I, I came up are uh, talking about research. I am of the opinion that research is very important in healthcare and what part of the research is that maybe we can have a think think tank or maybe a group of technologies that are working for our healthcare services. Artificial intelligence has a double-edged sword. It has its negatives. That one is uh, undisputable. But as, in my opinion, the advantages artificial intelligence has overweight the negatives of artificial intelligence. The clinical decision system can help us help personalize treatment to our clients. It can also help us Having taken an informed decision, it can also help us reduce medical errors. It can also help us take shared decision with the patient because the artificial intelligence will know your patient better than you. By mere putting their, their, their biometrics, they know their health problems and they know their, the artificial intelligence will tell you all the history of the patient. Also, it can help us in giving qualitative patient education and also efficient access to information. It can also enable us to have continuity of care, just like it can also help us manage chronic diseases in a better way, and finally, monitoring and follow-up. In conclusion, all what I'm trying to say is that patient-centered care is the most important, the most valuable manner and approach to patients' care. If we can do it in their own way, then we are better rather than doing it in our own way. And, and, and secondly, there is a need we involve technology so much. We shouldn't be waiting for the industries to bring technology and we begin to try to cope with the technology. Rather, we should be the ones to be driving the technology. If you are driving the technology, we can dictate to the technology, we can dictate to the industries, we can dictate to the IT specialists that this is what we want. This is how we, we want technology to help us do our work. And the sky is our limit in trying to alleviate patient suffering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.